Yes. Hello and welcome to The Green Room at Furnitubes. I'm your host, Catherine Barrett, and we're here every month with a new episode. Join us for industry musings, interviews and discussions exploring all things landscape architecture, street furniture and urban design. So I'm joined today by Simon Pitt-Keithley, Chief Executive of Camden Town, Camden Highline, a member of the Ministry of Housing, Communities and Local Government and a champion for small business. And we're here to talk about the exciting plans in Camden for the Camden High Line, transforming a disused railway viaduct into a new part in the sky. Thank you for joining me today, Simon. My pleasure. Can you tell us a little bit about the High Line, what region it spans, where it would take people from to, how big it is? Sure, yeah. I mean, it's 1.2k in length and it runs from Kentish Town Road in Camden Town, so right near the new bit of the Camden Market and goes all the way through Camden Road Station and Camden Street down to York Way, so right at the top of the new King's Cross development that's happening down there. Cool. And it's going to be an amazing park in the sky, like you say. Yeah, mm. and connecting parts of London yeah. through a lovely green open space. Exactly, and it's yeah. it's very, you know, it's, a, it's kind of getting to King's Cross from where we are now yeah. in Camden Town is a little bit higgledy-piggledy, and it's just it going to be a straight line, you <laughs> know, and lovely. that's, that's going to be nice, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and, and green and lovely, as, as you say, as well. So where did the idea come from? Where did it sort of germinate from? Where did the inspiration come from? So I think we picked it up because there was a, an academic at UCL who looked at Highline potentials, knowing New York and Paris. The Paris one predates New York, by the way. Wow. People don't know that, you ah. see. The French got there first, right. bit like America. Yeah. So this chap, Oliver O'Brien, did a blog on potential bits of disused railway that could be used like that. And he put this section as number one as the most viable. Wow. And we sort of happened across this and former board member of mine who was then still, he's now retired, a, a director at Arup who'd been a board member here in Canada before. He'd moved to Canada and he was running their Canada office, but still in touch with the Kentish Towner, which is a local publication here from when he used to live here. And he happened to see the headline and phoned me up and said, surely this would be a great thing. And that kind of got us going. Mm -hmm. And then we managed to persuade the board of Camden Town Unlimited, which is the business improvement district of Camden Town. So we managed to persuade them it was a good idea, i.e. I and my team could start spending time on it. And we've worked it up into an idea that is now where it is not that far from finalised design and planning. Right. So obviously community has been a really big part of this. You've had sort of people who've been on the board getting really involved. How community driven has it been and how will they be impacted by access to this and how they got involved? Partly being a business improvement district, we're here to represent businesses that elect us every five years. So we better have kind of engaged with them. And a huge part of that includes community groups around local residents, because the council obviously are very important to everything that we do as a business improvement district. So I think it was kind of instinctive for us to do that because most of what we do has to kind of have that kind of engagement. But I think we also, talking to the people at the New York High Line, learnt some lessons from them. They said early doors, get the community engaged as much as you can as early on because it sort of happened to them. Yes. And then it became a phenomenon and local people didn't feel it was necessarily theirs. Right. So they were kind of quite explicit in the it's a good idea to get as many people involved as you can yeah. so that's what we've really tried to do a bottom-up thing you know? yeah so how did you go about generating the interest and support i've been on some of the zoom town halls which are great and some really good very direct questions what other things have you been doing to, to get so well, well we had a big crowdfund early yep. doors and that helped people kind of become aware of it and yep. you know lots of people made little small donations we had we made a model out of it and put all their names on the side of it and that sort of really got people starting to think about it and talk about it. And then we just used all the obvious means, email lists, subscribe to and right. and social media. And that became a real word of mouth thing. Yeah, yeah. So 1,500 people have been on these little walks we do of groups of 2025. Ah, okay. So you can't actually go, I mean, I've been up there, but you can't yeah. go up no, there we, at the moment. We were looking for ways yeah, to get Yeah, we were trying up there. to get up there, yeah. Were you arrested? <laughs> no. no. Um, but <laughs> but it's uh, you can't get up there because there's live trains right. running beside you. Right. So we're going to have to segregate. Uh, yeah. people from the trains so it's not a particularly safe place to go at the moment if you're not wandering around but you know, it's fine you yeah. know it's escorted by network rail people right. but actually what you do at ground level is just kind of walk around and look up yes and you can look through the gird of some of the bridges where all the tracks have been taken up yeah so 1500 people have done that yeah. there's a sort of virtual version as well on the website at camdenhighline.com where you can go and plug in your headphones and do the walk yourself 
So I think it became quite a grassroots thing. People yeah. started talking to each other and people are interested in greenery, started getting involved and yeah. lots of people have been to New York and know about it. There's also lots of people who've never heard of something like that. Right. Particularly down through those estates, yeah. if you think of Agar Grove, Maiden Lane, the places that it's going to go through. You know, we're doing quite a lot of engagement down there now, just trying to get people to understand what it is. And how amazing it's going to be, because yeah. suddenly you have an amazing green public space on exactly. your doorstep, yeah. rather than having to yeah. travel to get And together. also it has quite a lot of practical benefits that we hadn't really thought about at the time. So because it's going to go right through the middle of Camden Overground Station, so you'll be able to get off an eastbound train straight onto the highway. Wow. Because of that, it means that people who live down, say, at the Maiden Lane end at the King's Cross will actually only be a 10-minute walk from the Camden Road station. And people down there tend not to think of the overground as being that accessible to them. But actually it will be. And there's a a whole load of additional benefits that we didn't really appreciate at the time. Biodiversity has become a huge thing, you know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so it's gone from being a great kind of park in the sky to including biodiversity and exactly. nice, making it a nice place to exactly. live, getting to places more easily. Exactly right. You know, the mayor of London has an aspiration everyone should be within 400 metres of green space. Yeah. 10,000 people qualify for that when you open the High Line, which is partly to do with the lack of green space in and around that route, but yeah. it's also to do with the density of those housing estates, yeah. how many people live so yeah. close to that bit of disused railway if you go to 500 meters it's something like 20,000 people which is eight percent of Canada's population so you know I think yeah there's lots and lots of that stuff every time we do work on it you kind of discover new things about it that you hadn't thought about before which is lovely yeah yeah. so that was the kind of the beginning of it that how the community's been involved you held a fantastic competition to look at architects landscape architects engineers involved and you had over 70 entrants Tell us a little bit about the competition, some of the criteria, the judges, how you looked at the entries. Were you blown away? Was it what you were expecting? It was much more successful than we were expecting and much more international and much more sort of interesting in terms of the sort of creativity of the teams. We were asking people to put together a team that would help us solve the problem, if you like, in the first instance. So we had 75 entries, an organisation called Colander Associates who do that kind of thing ran the competition for us and put it all together and helped us assemble the jury of the great and the good and some quite interesting people not just architects and landscape architects but also people are sort of interested in the sort of future of common infrastructure and things like that so it's a really great team you can see on the website who was on it brian eno was in one of the teams who didn't get shortlisted which i personally think is a crime but anyway i wasn't on the jury so they shortlisted five of the teams they then worked up we gave them a stipend they worked up their ideas and then the jury picked the uh, final winners from those five all of whom were brilliant yeah. and it was uh, James Corner Field Operations that won and, and the team did the New York Highline as right. well which you know was helpful quite a good, quite a good precursor <laughs> it right? was uh, you know but, but actually not the winning criteria uh-huh. actually I think the, right. the thing that really swung it was the team they put together right. so VPPR architects a really cool little female founded uh, architectural practice that are based in Kentish Town right. just 10 minutes up the road a street space so a really cool engagement consultancy that are already have already employed someone from the local community to help us get deeper into those bits of the community that haven't heard about it yet Hugh Locke Atelier 10 Tony G I mean there's there's a really interesting group there looking at this not just people who did the New York Highline and I think that was the winning pitch really I think that's what really sold it for the jury and what's lovely for us is seeing the work progressing on a day-by-day basis even though some of them are stuck in New York hey we've all learned to do everything online yes It's really taking shape and I'm really excited about next week's town hall, actually. Kind of let people start to have a look at where the thinking's going, some of the initial ideas. So they'll get to see plans? They'll get to see ideas. It's not a finished plan yet. No, 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 no. They'll get to see ideas around that. We're hoping to have finalised designs by Christmas. Right. Um, So where are we now? July? Yeah, yeah, that should be feasible. And then depending on Camden's planning processes, maybe have approved planning permission by March-ish. I'm crossing fingers now yeah. because that's where we hope to go. But yeah, it's it's really taking shape. This idea started pre-pandemic. Oh yeah, way before, yeah. Way before. How has COVID impacted for the good and for the bad? I mean, it delayed the competition. Right. So we were originally going to launch in April last yeah. year. Things changed there. But actually, once we got our head around it, and I think we launched in September in the end. Right. 
the process went remarkably quickly. I think by then we'd all learned to do stuff right. online. And yeah. also there were a lot of people, I think, who'd been sat around for a while. Yes. Keen to get their teeth into something, you know. <laughs> so I think it, that, that may have helped, in a sense, right. the, the number of entries and the quality of the entries. Yeah. Because they really were phenomenal. And I think that since then, because we've learned to do so much virtually, I think it's actually had quite a positive impact. Yep. And some of those benefits that I was talking about earlier on have become much more significant now. Yes. So the way we move around our towns and cities, yep. you know, air quality was always an issue. We wanted to reduce our, our reliance on the car. Yep. But the pandemic has kind of made us much, much more aware of how we'd like to move around and yep. what's important to us and how important green space is. Yes. And as I mentioned, things like biodiversity and, you know, health and well-being and mental fitness, health, yes. you know, those sorts of things, in a sense, play so well into the high line um, yeah. thoughts and, and, and direction of travel and have become so important to us all now. So I think in a way it's been had a very positive impact ask me that when I still haven't quite raised enough money to build the thing but you know that's I think where it, it feels like at the moment. How have Highline and how has James Cornerfield Operations thought about inclusivity so we've talked about engagement from the grassroots in terms of getting people involved and engaged but in terms of making sure everybody has access to the Highline what thoughts are there around inclusivity I'm sure the town hall this week will address some of those with ideas there's lots of parts to that. Yep. There's the sort of engagement that I've been talking about, just getting people aware, getting them to feedback. I mean, we've done a thousand hours in local schools. So five local schools yep. over the last, I mean, it, you know, the pandemic slowed that down yes. a lot, but we still managed to get a lot of time in yep. um, uh, five local schools, getting people to think about what the Highline would mean for them. We actually picked some of the designs and sent them off to the design team. You know, they made little models and we've had some, quite, you know, that's been really uh, interesting. And of course, they're the future users, Absolutely. you know, as are their parents. Yes. And so, you know, we've tried to do it from that way. All the stuff I talked about earlier. And as I said, Street Space, the consultancy who are really picking up the engagement yeah. now as part of the design and planning process. You know, they've actually employed someone from the local community to go out and help do the lemonade stands. Yep. And, you know, there's another person we're trying to recruit there. So we're trying to do it that way. Obviously, in terms of inclusivity and access, There'll be lifts. Um, and even though there are some constrained areas, you've got to think about how you get disability issues through those, yep. you know, wheelchair users, et cetera. Yes. So all of that has to be part of our thinking. We wouldn't get through planning even if, yep. if we didn't think, think, think like that. Um, never mind whether the, the fact that we want to. And then I think in terms of users, I mean, it's, it's difficult to predict, but if you look at the way in which Paris and New York are used, right. I mean, it's possible that you could increase footfall across the area by you know a couple of million it's just because these things tend to attract yeah. and in some ways it's about how you manage, manage that, that as much as making sure that everyone has access the things like the um camley street camden council are doing a whole new development under there and that, that's that's an ongoing process but the high line will, will form a major part of the east west accessibility of that whole new development there so people living and working around there in a sense without the high line would have if you've ever been to camley street yeah. would suffer the difficulties of right. you can really only go north <laughs> or south and so you know that's another part of that how it becomes integrated really yeah. into everything around it and i think we keep trying to find new and different ways of doing that tell me about fundraising how does fundraising so, work where are your sources so, so the, yeah so we kind of there's, there's four ways of thinking about the money if you like yeah. there was the feasibility stage which right. the business improvement district and the crowd fund funded yeah. And thank you to everyone who made donations to the crowdfund. It was extremely useful. We spent the money yep. and we basically proved that you can do it yes. and not bugger up the trains and it's feasible and yep. all that. The second phase is kind of where we are now. So that was to get a design team on board, do the design and get it all the way through. So planning permissions and everything else like that. Right. So that's all bought and paid for. And that's been paid for by, again, the Business Improvement District, generous donations from the landowners at each end, down at King's Cross and here in Camden Town, right. and also some help from Camden Council, which is jiggery poker it around some of the Section 106 money, for those who know, yep. in order to help us do that. So we've raised over a million quid to date, I would Gosh. think, all in, all in all. And of course, the Business Improvement District behind it is not unhelpful. Right. Because it means that me and my team are already bought and paid for. Right. So we're not trying. No, I'm not you're trying to fundraise for my people. salary. Right, 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 yeah. right, right, right. Yeah, I'm yep. not saying to funders, you've got to yep. pay for me. You know, yep, yep. I'm bought and paid for, and that I think is not unhelpful. And then we want to raise about forty million. We think about. I mean, it's not the design isn't finalised yet, but we've had cost consultants look at it, and we think it's about twelve million for each of the three sections. Right. It's four entrances, so yep. three sections. Plus, there's always additional costs. But we also want to raise a five million endowment 
so that we can fund the maintenance in perpetuity yes. because that's the fourth stage yeah. which is how do you fund these things yeah. ongoing absolutely and it's interesting if you look at somewhere like the new york highline or you know those kind of projects on that side of america uh, or on the edges you know they have this wonderful philanthropic model you know yeah. big dinner everyone turns up writes checks <laughs> done yeah we don't do that that's not <laughs> us and that's fine you know but we need to think about right. doing things in different ways right. so hence you know try and buy an asset the rental right. income from that funds because it's got to be a free to access yeah. facility yeah. it's got to be open to everyone yeah. you know doesn't mean we might not have great events up there and as i always say to the community groups that we're involved with you know one day we might have to call this the smirnoff highline right you know <laughs> it's not in any way intended Sounds to be fun. a uh, yeah exactly <laughs> nothing nothing against vodka companies of any kind and there are other other <laughs> other kinds but um you know it's really just to kind of seed the idea yeah that this is going to need to be paid for and it's going to be expensive if yes. we want it to be amazing. Yes. And we do. And it's interesting that brands are already coming to talk to us right. about the potential for that as well. And all those bits, in a sense, the big international design competition, yes. the quality of the entries, the interest of people like, you know, the mayor of London had it in his manifesto at the last election. Yeah. The local authority are being very supportive. In fact, the minister for London as well being very supportive. You know, we've got that kind of support both from that level yes and also from Grass the grassroots roots. level and that makes lots of people interested for lots of different reasons and a very engaged team in the middle pushing everything forward you spotted that yes <laughs> <laughs> uh, so tell me some of the activities that you're doing to fundraise we're thinking in terms of about the next stage funding that big 40 million chunk and we think we'll get that from sort of four different sources so from the public sector hopefully from commercial as i've talked about various activities and branding and, 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 and relationships with brands. We think high net worth individuals contribute to this sort of thing. And we think the trust and foundation world yeah. will have an interest in green infrastructure community type projects. And I think those first two, the public sector and the, and the commercial stuff, I think we, we, we're progressing quite well. But I'm always interested in the networks around those high net worth individuals, the people who are trustees of trusts and foundations, you know, your listeners will know yes. people that kind of interact with those worlds yeah. who might be interested in this. And just as everything as, as everything we do kind of falls back on word of mouth on yeah. the end, I think, you know, I can't sort of, out. yeah, exactly. I can't do enough of yes. that. Just trying to help people understand that we're still looking and if you know anyone, get in touch. Yeah, because I think if, well, not I think, I believe that this is a, a cause that solves so many, not problems, but it, it creates so many opportunities. Exactly um, right. And it, it answers uh, the need for more inclusivity, more green space in the urban environment, accessibility, biodiversity. I mean, it's just a yeah. fantastic cause to support. No, I think that's right. And it's also because it's outside any other development. Yeah. So it's not part of a commercial project. It's, you know, we're an independent charity just doing it yeah. off our own back. It, it also kind of raises interesting questions about how we fund common infrastructure this is it. in the world in which we're moving into you know yeah. it's it, we don't have a tax base to do this sort of thing really right so these independent bodies like us that pop up and just take on the responsibility yeah. are quite interesting to start yeah. thinking about in that longer term absolutely what does the funding of common infrastructure look like going because ahead? it's providing eat more equal access to outdoor space and i think that's really important and how we look at that going forwards um, yeah who's responsible for that so yeah, it's yeah. an important yeah. question yeah. No, indeed. One which we shall not answer today, I suspect. No, that's another, that's another podcast. Thank you so much, Simon, for your time. It's been lovely to hear more about the Camden Highline, how it started, the process, where we are right now, or where you are right now, and how the wider audience can help support the Camden Highline. Fantastic. Thank you very much, Simon. <laughs>